word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> All right, happy October. Let's get started. Galaxy of Terror was also known as Mind Warp Infinity of Terror. It was produced by Roger Corman and stars Edward Albert, Robert England, and Sid Haig, amongst others. It's about a bunch of astronauts or some shit who go to a planet and try to rescue some other astronauts. Look at the seat belts. They look like they were taken from a car. <laughs> oh, those are nice. I like them. They should have the automatic seat belts from Star Trek Nemesis, the deleted scenes. When they land on the planet, they end up damaging their ship, of course, dipshits. Then they find an evil alien pyramid, which makes people's worst nightmares become reality. I love the landscape. It reminds me of Junk City in Transformers, the cartoon movie. And all the gloomy architecture and war-torn atmosphere reminds me of aliens. And would you know, James Cameron worked on this film. Apparently the walls of the spaceship were made out of McDonald's cartons. <laughs> That's awesome. And apparently James Cameron used the same thing in Battle Beyond the Stars. Maybe he was eating a lot of McDonald's back then. From what I gather, the monsters that we see are all generated from the crew's paranoia and fear. The death scenes are the highlight of the film. This commander is killed by blood-sucking tentacles. Listen to the sound effects. It sounds like a cartoon sound effect. Sid Haig has some kind of boomerang made out of crystals. While inside the pyramid, his fear gets the best of him and the crystal goes inside his arm like a razor blade. Guess they could still amputate his arm. Oh wait. Or he can just knock his own arm off. What's this? The severed arm is still alive? Wow. Speaking of the severed arm, apparently James Cameron got the maggots to move around on it by passing a current of electricity through the arm. It's nasty. A lot of attention was paid to detail for such a ridiculous death scene. I love Sid Haig and everything he's in, but he barely speaks in this movie. I've heard that's because he didn't like the dialogue in the script, so he asked Roger Corman if his character could not say much. In fact, he only says one line the whole movie. Reminds me of how Christopher Lee refused to speak while playing Dracula. Next character to die? Uh, I guess there's no better way to explain it. She literally gets fucked to death by a giant maggot. Yeah. It looks like it just shot off a bunch of... Oh, God. Yuck. Well, there's something they definitely didn't do in Alien. Next guy, killed by a random demon and thrown down a pit. You only get to see the monster's face for a split second. And when you do, I don't know whether to laugh or shit my pants. Next girl, she dies a really gory death. First it rips her guts out, and then it wraps the tentacles around her head and squeezes until her head explodes! Damn! Remember that video I made about the heads blow up? I don't know if you saw it or not, but if you did, then I, this scene should have been in it. I just didn't know about it before. I dropped the ball. Some of the special effects have stood the test of time, while others haven't. Like I said, the production design is awesome. Uh, except the inside of the spaceship, the control boards are kind of dated. The optical effects are also pretty dated. But the gore effects are A+. There's even some stop motion animation, which always looks appealing for some reason. The stop motion was done by Brian Burchin, who did a ton of effects works in movies including Star Trek II, and he did storyboards for He-Man, The Real Ghostbusters, and the Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons, to name a few. Man, Roger Corman sure made a lot of movies. These days people know him for stuff like Sharktopus and forget a lot of his earlier works like this. Around the same time, Corman made another alien-style clone called Forbidden World, also known as The Mutant. Forbidden World recycled a lot of footage from Battle Beyond the Stars, and there's the McDonald's containers. Corman knew how to get the job done. Look at that, the pilot looks like a stormtrooper. And there's so much recycled footage from other movies. But for a guy who pumps out so many movies so fast, I guess you can't blame him. I can't tell you how many movies I've seen the infamous Corman Castle shot show up. The ending to this movie is terrible. The main hero meets up with the villain, this guy called the Master, who has a glowing red face. He defeats him and then somehow he's transformed into the new Master, which is bad or something, and then it ends. Maybe they were trying to set up a sequel, making a new bad guy, but it just didn't work. 
That said, this is a movie you'll probably enjoy if you're a fan of older horror and sci-fi movies. It's got well-designed sets, a creepy, claustrophobic atmosphere, lots of gore, and plenty of disgusting monsters. So next time someone asks you about Galaxy of Terror, you just say, Oh yeah, that movie. That's the one where the giant maggot fucks a lady to death. Yeah, good movie. <laughs> Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. In 1933, King Kong was the champion on top of the Empire State Building, but in 1982, another monster took up residence on top of the Chrysler Building. Q, the winged serpent, is a scaly, dragon-like creature which snatches sunbathers off the rooftops of buildings, sending body parts and blood raining onto the streets. Hysteria spreads over the city while police try to investigate. Meanwhile, a small-time crook discovers the giant nest which contains the beast's egg. This crook is played by Michael Moriarty, who I know as Harry Potter from the first Troll movie. My name is Harry Potter. And the main detective is played by David Carradine, recently best known as Bill from Kill Bill. We don't see the monster too often, but thankfully both these actors do a really good job and keep this film watchable. Moriarty's character, Jimmy, is this real sleazeball who wants to capitalize on the monster by selling his knowledge of the serpent's hiding spot for the hefty sum of one million dollars. What a jerk. People are getting killed and all he cares about is money. Going back to King Kong again, it kind of reminds me of Carl Denham. All he cared about was money as well. Jimmy's not just an asshole, he's a clever, sneaky asshole. He gets involved with some gang members who are looking for some stolen loot from him. So what does Jimmy do? He tells them that he put the jewelry on the top of the Chrysler building, which is where the creature lives, so of course they go up there and they get devoured. I love this guy, I mean I hate him. He's obnoxious, he's a whimpering coward that drinks, beats up his girlfriend, and treats people like garbage. Watching this movie, I really couldn't stand this guy, but then I realized he's the kind of guy that you're really supposed to hate. There's a lot of characters like that. There's the guy in the Star Trek Next Generation episode, Chain of Command, who takes over as captain for a brief period. We're not on a research mission. Get it done. And of course, there's Biff from Back to the Future. Hello? Hello? All these characters you hate for different reasons, but you also love. Something trivial I have to say is that there aren't many monster movies that start with the letter Q. There's the Quatermass films, but that's about all I can think of that's relatively well known. So it had me wondering, why is the monster named Q anyway? Well, it has some history behind it. The ancient Aztecs believed in a half-reptile, half-bird god that they made sacrifices to. It wouldn't be the first time in history that a monster was mistaken for a god. Apparently the Aztec priests would tie down some unfortunate soul and rip their beating heart from their chest as an offering to their Mesoamerican serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that name properly, and that's why you could just say Q. And here, the monster, which actually resembles a pterosaur, has supposedly been summoned to modern-day New York through rituals performed by contemporary Aztec worshippers. Wow, so there's a whole cult tied in with this thing. If they ever decide to remake Q the Winged Serpent, maybe they could do a versus movie. Q versus Q versus Q. Yeah. One nice thing this film has going for it is all the nice helicopter shots filmed above New York City. They should remake it in IMAX. And while the shots of the winged beast are brief, they were at least smart enough to have it appear every five or ten minutes. I hate movies that never show the monster till the very, very end, like the monster of Pieters Blancas. Fuck that movie. It's kind of interesting how none of the detectives seem too surprised that there's a giant reptile monster flying around. Normally in these movies, they never believe that the monster is real until they see it for themselves. That's especially true with vampire flicks. The strength of the vampire is that people will not believe in him. Here they treat it almost like it's a regular everyday natural disaster. I've said it before, but stop motion is always cool to look at for some reason. Even for the 80s, this seemed a little dated. 
but it gives the movie a unique charm. The Serpent was designed by Randy Cook, and the stop motion was done by David Allen. David Allen's done a lot of effects work on many horror and sci-fi movies. And here's a cool bit of trivia to connect it to King Kong one more time. He animated this awesome Volkswagen commercial from the 1970s and based it on the original King Kong. It's kind of cool to see a stop-motion King Kong in full color like this. The idea of the commercial is that the car was spacey and luxurious with lots of extra room. I never thought I'd see King Kong's car. wonder if Godzilla had a car. I guess he'd need a giant speedboat to get him to and from Monster Island. Q was directed by Larry Cohen, who brought you films like It's Alive, The Stuff, Maniac Cop, and God Told Me To. I think he did a decent job updating the 50s sci-fi genre for a later audience. And that's what it is, a cliché genre film. A hysterical mob of panicked people, an anti-hero you hate so much you love him, and of course a giant monster that loves tearing people to shreds. What's not to like about this movie? Within the first 10 minutes, you see a man skinned alive, a window washer get decapitated, and a naked woman get eaten. The movie's tagline says it all. Q. That's all you'll have time to say before it tears you apart. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> Night Beast is one flashy movie that begins with a really flashy title screen. So it's a typical alien invader movie, and guess how they all begin? A spaceship crashes to Earth. Well, this one hits an asteroid before it hits Earth, so that's a little different. Yeah, there's a lot of movies like this. Like The Curse with Will Whedon. A spaceship or meteor or whatever crashes down in the woods. Why has it always got to be the woods? You'll never see an alien ship come down in front of a Wawa. Yeah, let's see how many people know what a Wawa is. Some hunters come out to see what happened, and then, oh boy, they're in trouble. Wow, if you're going to die, at least go out in a shiny, spectacular display. Yeah, that alien's got a laser gun, and he is not hesitating to use it. Get the fuck out of here! Yeah, that guy's got the right idea. Just run. This thing is really pissed. I think the alien likes shooting people just because it looks really cool. This guy steps out of his house to see what's going on. Bad idea. Almost as bad idea as that hair. Then the alien comes and starts ripping his guts out. I guess the laser was getting a little boring. That's the girlfriend over there screaming. She's not helping at all. I guess there's nothing she can do though, but just watch and scream. I don't know what this alien's problem is. These kids here are just trying to get away and the alien blasts their car and disintegrates the whole vehicle. This monster doesn't even let kids live. I like that he wears clothing too, so it's not just like some kind of mindless animal. This thing has intelligence, using a laser gun and all that, so it's obviously aware of what it's doing. It's just killing for fun. And it's pretty creative with its killings too. Here it rips some guy's head off. They really didn't do a good job with the skin tones. The head and the hand are completely different complexions. It even takes a guy's arm off. What makes this creature even worse is that it kills both day and night. You're never safe from it, even though the movie's called Night Beast. I don't think this thing ever sleeps. Just kill, kill, kill. 24-7. There's also a really bad fight scene. Makes the fight scene from They Live look like a masterpiece. Put on the glasses. You know what? The one reason to watch this movie is because of the monster. <laughs> I like him. The creature effects are pretty good. I can't say the same for all the gore effects, though. He looks like he's smiling. He's so happy to be mutilating people. This is one sick night beast. There's other movies where aliens kill for fun, like The Predator. But there, somehow it makes a little more sense, like it's for sport. But in Night Beast, the alien accidentally comes to Earth because a meteor hit the ship. 
So, might as well go on a killing spree. Of course he was attacked first by the usual guys in flannel shirts. It even kills main characters that you think are gonna live. It's not like in Star Trek where you know everyone in a red shirt is gonna die. Speaking of Star Trek, guess who did the music? J.J. Abrams. I wasn't even aware that he was a composer. You know, for the next Star Trek movie, I hope he brings back the Night Beast. In all honesty, Night Beast, it's a pretty shitty movie, but there's a lot of funny moments, a lot of neon and lasers, and a lot of gore. If that's what you want, then check it out. It's a lot different than E.T. If E.T. is champagne, then this is light beer. Not as classy, but it gets the job done. <laughs> yeah. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> How do you make a movie based on an anthology TV series? Well, make it an anthology film with four different stories, each with a different director. Each segment is a remake, or at least inspired by a classic Twilight Zone episode. My favorite part is right before the credits. Two guys are in a car just casually talking when all of a sudden Dan Aykroyd turns into a monster and kills his friend. There's no reason. It comes out of nowhere and that's why I love it. It's just a little warm up to get the movie started. The first segment by John Landis, director of An American Werewolf in London, is called Time Out, which is loosely based on the classic episode A Quality of Mercy, which guest starred Leonard Nimoy. Anyway, this first episode, which stars Vic Morrow, is the story of a racist bigot who's sent back in time to Nazi Germany to get a taste of his own medicine. Sadly, while filming, there was a helicopter accident where Vic Morrow and two children were killed. This scene was not included in the picture, for obvious reasons. Unfortunately, it's not a very good episode either, although a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that they couldn't finish filming it the way originally intended. The second segment, Kick the Can, is about a group of elderly people who want to relive their youth. So they play a game of Kick the Can and are reverted to their younger selves. That's all there is to it. Boring as shit. It's surprising that out of all the classic Twilight Zone episodes, they chose to remake this one and that a great director, Steven Spielberg, is responsible for the most bland entry in the film. The third segment is when things start to get good. It's a remake of one of the best classic episodes, It's a Good Life, where a spoiled kid has special powers and uses them against his family. It's directed by Joe Dante, who's most famous for directing Gremlins. Speaking of Gremlins, it even has Dick Miller in a small role. Love that guy, he played Futterman in Gremlins. This segment is very different from the original episode. For one thing, a woman accidentally smashes the kid's bike with her car, so she gives him a ride home and meets his family. It's a good change because this allows us to observe their lifestyle through the perspective of an outside character. In the original episode, the kid forces the family to watch dinosaur films on television, but in this version, he makes them watch cartoons. He uses his power to make the cartoons come alive and terrorize the family, which results in some amazing special effects. The effects were done by Rob Bodden, whose work includes John Carpenter's The Thing. It's all a tribute to the golden age of cartoons from Warner Brothers and Fleischer. I like how the house turns black and white to imitate a black and white cartoon. He fulfills all kinds of demented punishments toward the other members of the house in all kinds of ways that only a child could dream up. It's great stuff, but lacks the suspense of the original episode. The final segment, directed by George Miller, is a remake of the episode Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, starring William Shatner. Shatner's performance of a man with an intense phobia of flying is what makes the original so good. He's hilarious. Wait, so both Shatner and Nimoy were both on the Twilight Zone? Too bad they both weren't in the episode with Burgess Meredith where he played the devil. Then it would have been Kirk, Spock, and Satan. Totally illogical. 
So anyway, this time, the role of the nervous airline passenger is played by John Lithgow, and he does a respectable job. There's not much different here, except that you get to see a bit more of the monster. Well, technically, they say it's a gremlin in the original episode. Gremlins. A gremlin. Gremlins. Maybe Joe Dante should have directed this part as well. In the original, the gremlin looks absurd. It's one of the goofiest creatures ever put to screen, but it somehow fit alongside Shatner. That's where the remake prevails. Here, the creature is very well done. The moment when you first see it up close to the window comes as a real shocker and gave me nightmares as a kid. I like the original for its humorous charm, but the remake is way scarier. Burgess Meredith does the voiceover between chapters. He does a good job and was the best person they could have chosen, being that he was the star of many of the classic episodes. You're about to meet an angry man, Mr. William Connor, who carries on his shoulder a chip the size of the national debt. Still, it leaves you wishing Rod Serling was still alive. Twilight Zone the movie fails to capture the essence of the original TV series, but thanks to the last two segments, it's worth a watch. <laughs> Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> Supposedly, the deadly spawn cost less than $20,000 to make, which is really impressive considering all the effects. It's considered by some to be an alien ripoff, but it's more of a throwback to B movies. And it's a tribute to great classics like The Thing from Another World. The Thing from Another World. Famous monsters. A meteor crashes to Earth, just like in The Blob. The monster kills some campers and then makes its nest in the basement of an average suburban home. It then kills the mother and father who are supposed to be going on vacation. The main character is a kid named Charles who's a big fan of monster movies. Look at all the stuff he has in his room. He's got masks of the Gorn and Mugato from Star Trek. It's unlikely that a kid in the early 80s would have access to this much stuff. I like all the posters, Valley of Guanji, Monster on the Campus, The Green Slime, 20 Million Miles to Earth, King Kong, and Frankenstein. Funny, I had that same Frankenstein poster growing up. I like his favorite movie choices. The Mole People, Frankenstein. Uh... It, the terror from beyond space. Uh -huh. See that? He threw out some more obscure ones and not just the main classics. Charles is the one who figures out that the monsters are hurt by sound. The monster spawn itself looks something like the piranha plant in Little Shop of Horrors. What the fuck was that? The spawns seem to grow as they eat, getting bigger and bigger until finally there's one the size of an entire mountain. Again, it's similar to the blob, the way the monster grows as it absorbs people. Dude, it's bigger now. Who knows how far this intergalactic menace has spread. For all we know, the entire world could be covered with these fanged beasts. But the movie is told from the perspective of just one household and how they have to fend off the creature. In that respect, it's sort of like Night of the Living Dead, where a small group have to survive within the confines of a house. The monster itself just needs to eat to survive and to feed its offspring. So there's not much to explain, it's just acting out of instinct. These spawns are here just to eat your guts. Although on the DVD there's a bonus feature with a comic strip that gives more backstory to the history of the monster, where you find out the deadly spawn were actually weapons of an alien race. There's a lot of gore shown in explicit detail, although sometimes they cheap out and just throw buckets of blood on the walls. I don't know what's going on here, but it sounds like somebody's farting. You may think I'm making that up, but then they cut to a woman flushing the toilet, so it had to have been intentional. For a low-budget film, the effects are really good. They were done by John Dodds, who worked on other movies including Spookies, Night Beast, and Alien Resurrection. In one of the most horrifying gore scenes, Charles goes into the basement and discovers the alien, and the first thing that happens, it coughs up the head of his mother. It's 
It's the right level of cheese, but also very disturbing. The executive producer was Tim Hildebrandt, who did the artwork for the original Star Wars poster. He also provided the house in which the movie takes place. And the kid who plays Charles is actually his son. No wonder there's props all over his bedroom. His dad worked on Star Wars. This is a film that goes straight for the jugular with unapologetic gore. You'd expect there to be nudity too, but nope, just gore. Well, in the 50s, they didn't need asses on the screen to get asses in the seats. And this movie seems like a tribute to that time, except with a lot of gore. Gore, gore, gore. Blood, blood, blood. There was a sequel planned, but the script didn't have anything to do with the first movie, so it became an entirely different movie called Metamorphosis, The Alien Factor. It has some interesting life-size and miniature stop-motion creature effects. That's about all I can say about The Deadly Spawn. It has some horrendous acting and very dull moments, but there's enough blood and guts to keep any gore hound satisfied. And for the small budget they had, they did an unbelievable job. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> Trauma Entertainment. They make disgusting, horrible films with no apologies. Love them or hate them, director Lloyd Kaufman from Trauma has written two of the most inspirational books about filmmaking I have ever read. Toxic Avenger was the first film that paved the way for the Troma brand. Since then, they've been making extremely fucked up films like Terror Firmer and Poultrygeist. But this is the one that started it all and made the monster Toxie the Troma mascot. Toxie is to Troma as Mario is to Nintendo. Originally, the film was going to be called Health Club Horror. It's the story of Melvin, a janitor at a health club who's socially awkward and gets picked on by all the popular girls and jocks. Would you take a look at that fucking guy? He's always got that shit-eating grin on his face. He's lovable and geeky, very exaggerated, like if you put George McFly and Steve Urkel together. Great, let's say seven o'clock. Look, at that, that'll be good for me too, because I gotta clean the toilets in there anyway around that time. <laughs> All the characters are exaggerated in this hyper-reality. The bullies are so evil, they beat up old ladies. Did you see her face when I punched her? <laughs> beat that old lady like a dog! Even worse, they drive around at night and run people over. They hit a kid on a bicycle, which is bad enough. But then they look back and see that he's not dead. Time to finish the job. Ugh, they squashed his head. This movie has serious balls. One time I tried to watch this on cable, on demand, and they cut out the scene. That's how shocking it is. You can't even watch it on fucking cable. Even though they showed all the nudity and all the rest of the gore, they didn't even have a message at the beginning to let you know the film was edited for content. Stop and think how simple the effect was pulled off. The head was just a watermelon with a wig on top. That's it. Anyway, the jocks hate Melvin for no sensible reason. They send him flying out a window into a vat of toxic waste, which transforms him into the hideous but lovable superhero, the Toxic Avenger. Somehow, Toxie has the power to detect corruption and goes to clean up the town, wiping out all crime. There seems to be some different plots going on. One is where Toxie goes after the corrupt businessmen, drug dealers, and pimps. And then at the same time, he's trying to take down all the bullies that embarrassed him in an act of revenge. It cuts back and forth between him stopping some street thugs to him trying to stab the girl that embarrassed him by making him wear a tutu, back to fighting off criminals, robbing a fast food joint. He's the city's hero, but he also has a personal agenda. Yeah, rip that coat, Toxie. He even helps a woman open a jar of popcorn. That's some heroic deed. It's also funny how his voice sounds nothing like Melvin's anymore. I just couldn't control myself. I've never done anything like this before. His name Toxie is added in the narration, but during the time of filming, they didn't have a name for him. For a movie that's so explicit, it holds off on revealing Toxie's face until the right time. 
So there is some genuine suspense, but other than that, it's full out gore. Toxie kills people in all sorts of over the top ways. He uses one guy's nuts like a punching bag and smashes a drug dealer's head in with weights. This extra bit with the fake body convulsing was another scene that was cut out on the cable version I saw. Come on, it doesn't even look realistic. You have to be a fucking pussy not to show this scene. The makeup was done by Jennifer Aspinall, who also worked on some other 80s films like Street Trash and Spookies. I don't know what to make of Toxie. Is he a superhero or a slasher villain? Maybe he's both. And that's pretty unique. It also pays tribute to Frankenstein with townspeople hunting down the monster. Other than that, it's hard to trace its roots in much else. This was a real original, one-of-a-kind film when it came out. It's the quintessential cult film. Even though it's real gory and geared towards adults, it made Toxie a household name and even had its own cartoon series, The Toxic Crusaders. When I was a kid, I only knew about the show. I had no idea it was based on a live action movie that I would never be allowed to see. The Toxic Avenger really made an impression on the world of cinema. It inspires independent filmmaking and encourages you to go shoot your own damn movie without conforming to any set guidelines. It influenced Peter Jackson into making some of his early horror films which started his career. So it's quite possible without Toxie, there would have been no Lord of the Rings films or at least with no Peter Jackson. If you're not sure if you like Troma or not, this is a good one to start with. Give it a go. <laughs> yeah. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness, 80s-a-thon. The Stuff. Catchy title. It's called The Stuff because nobody knows what the fuck it is. It's a food product and people think it's some kind of ice cream or something, but really, it's, um, The Stuff. Stuff that controls your mind. The only killer junk food movie I can think of. A message, maybe? That's right, don't eat junk food, kids. It's bad. So where'd this stuff come from? Well, some mine workers found it, and... What's this guy doing? He just fucking eats it? Would you eat something that you found on the ground? Ugh. Then some businessmen get involved, and the stuff gets mass-marketed. There's some competing ice cream company that sends out a detective to find out what the secret ingredient in the stuff is. He's played by Michael Moriarty from Q, the Winged Serpent. There's some kid who's trying to save the day by knocking the stuff off the shelves. But you can't stop the stuff. The stuff! It's everywhere! I imagine it tastes like Fluffernutter. I want some. There's even a commercial that makes fun of the Where's the Beef slogan. Where's the stuff? In 1984, fast food restaurant Wendy's put out a commercial where a woman asks where's the beef in reference to how small other burgers are. Where's the beef? This was a really popular 80s expression. Where's the beef? It's something that never really caught on to me. I just don't get it. There was even a where's the beef rap song. She got no response from ringing the bell, and that's when she started to yell, where's the beef? This movie has 80s written all over it. They're playing Atari, and there's Return of the Jedi shower curtains. So, back to the stuff. The effects were done by David Allen. And it's a Larry Cohen film, and has Michael Moriarty, so it's kind of like a cue the Winged Serpent reunion. The stuff effects are kind of like the blob, and are the highlight of the film. The best scene is when the guy gets killed in the radio station. Oh, he's got the stuff! Imagine if you're sleeping and then all of a sudden you get covered in all this, this stuff. They did the Nightmare on Elm Street trick here where they had a rotating room set. Supposedly it was the same actual set. The stuff itself was made from many materials. Foam, liquid plastic, actual ice cream, whipped cream, and buffalo jizz. 
Remember Ghostbusters 2 with the River of Slime? Well, if they ever make Ghostbusters 3, which will never happen, the thing that takes over the city should be the stuff. Imagine the finale of the film. The stuff versus Stay Puft. It's the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Well, the stuff. It's one hell of a movie monster because it's the kind that you don't know is there until you eat it. So next time you're eating some ice cream or something, you better think twice because it might just be the stuff. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> Here's a little um, shitty gem from the director of Independence Day, Roland Emmerich. Making Contact. Just sounds like some bland science fiction title. But no, really, it's about a possessed ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. For all you dummy lovers, this is a movie for you. It's about a kid who gets mysterious phone calls from his dead father. Look at the phone. It looks just like the Bat Phone from the Batman TV series. Well, a kid who gets a lot of weird phone calls is naturally going to be disturbed and getting made fun of a lot in school. So the teacher comes to visit his home to help him out, and then starts to notice the kid has special powers. Dude, the kid has powers. Why are you not freaking out? Here. I once read that such phenomena usually occur during puberty. So, just a normal textbook thing. Puberty, special powers, you know. Then he finds the dummy in some abandoned house. Then we find out that the phone calls he's been getting is not from his father, it's actually from the dead ventriloquist who once owned the dummy. From what I gather, the whole idea is that this ventriloquist had powers just like the kid, and he didn't know how to control them. So now he's trying to warn the kid, Joey, of its dangers. And the dummy, I guess, is just an evil product of these powers. But who cares? It's a dummy movie. Yeah, dummies are cool. Probably the best thing about this movie, other than the dummy, is Joey's bedroom is like a treasure trove of 80s pop culture. It's what I call a background movie. It's fun to look into the background and see how many things you can spot. There's a Smurfs record player, Sesame Street curtains, Return of the Jedi bed sheets, a Donkey Kong board game, and Pac-Mania drums? What? Snoopy, and a He-Man homework folder. Yeah, I remember those. Also, there's plenty of monsters, like a shitty relative of Oscar the Grouch. Holy shit, it's Darth Vader. Darth Vader is in this movie, and the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, imagine if you opened your closet door and the whole Star Wars universe starts spilling out into the room. That is every kid's dream. It also seems to have a lot to do with E.T. The kid looks like Elliot, there's a scene where scientists gather outside the house to study the phenomenon, there's a little blonde girl which is kind of like the Drew Barrymore equivalent, all the telephone stuff is kind of like E.T. trying to phone home. And there's also an E.T. drinking glass. There's a lot of product placement. Okay, we're looking at a Krispy Kreme sign. What's the point? You know how you do product placement? Like this. Three Budweiser classics. See, she asked for Budweiser. She didn't just say, give me a beer. That's how you fit product placement into a movie. Now, if a Budweiser sign was sitting right in front of Starfleet Academy, that would be stupid. And this movie is stupid. But hey, what can you ask for? It's a movie with a killer dummy and Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s-a-thon. <laughs>
How much more 80s can you get than Teen Wolf? At the time, it was a big deal. It had a sequel and a cartoon series. But how good is the original film? Frankly, it's average, except for one standout feature, Michael J. Fox. Whoa, this is heavy. Without him, this would be a run-of-the-mill, cheesy B-movie, but Fox's likability raises the bar. Everybody knows him as Marty McFly from the Back to the Future trilogy. But he wasn't originally cast as Marty. Another actor, Eric Stoltz, was the original. And while Stoltz was filming Back to the Future, Fox was working on Teen Wolf. In an interview one time, Michael J. said, Steven Spielberg's down the road doing great movies, and here I am playing a werewolf. Jeez Louise. Well, of course, the role of Marty was recast, and Fox got the part. It's funny to know, that's how Michael J. Fox was picturing himself at the time of the shooting. Embarrassed to be a werewolf. I'm a werewolf. He had Lon Chaney Jr. syndrome. Now I change into a wolf. I turn into a wolf. I change into a wolf. In Teen Wolf, Fox plays Scott Howard, who's just your typical teenager that's upset that his life is too ordinary, but that's all about to change. He plays on the high school basketball team and is lousy. He wants to date the popular chick while being oblivious to a girl named Boof who likes him. What kind of name is Boof, by the way? I assume it's a nickname, but they never bother to explain it. He's also got a nutty best friend named Styles who likes to wear zany catchphrase t-shirts and acts like a fool. This movie is drenched in 80s fashion. Just check out Styles' pants. And he's always got something wacky to say. But I uh, heard Mr. Murphy, you know, the shop teacher? Yeah. Got his dick caught in a vacuum cleaner. One of his other friends on the basketball team is Chuck, played by Mark Holden, who you might remember as Francis from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. So far, it's all typical stuff, until the beast inside Scott begins to emerge. He starts to find hairs on his chest, grows fur on his hands, and notices he's growing pointy ears. And then, he makes a full transformation into a wolf. With the transformation scene, they use a lot of cutaways, adding on makeup between each shot. It's not like the Universal movies where they gradually applied makeup to Lon Chaney's face through a series of cross dissolves. It's cheaper, but still works. It turns out his father is a werewolf too. Yeah, it's just a family curse. And Scott is unhappy that his father never told him about it. So his dad offers him some hot cocoa to ease the tension. Here's a nice hot cup of cocoa. Looks like you could use it. <laughs> That'll help. It's subtle humor like this that makes this movie great. Like, oh yeah, thanks. I just transformed into a fucking werewolf. I gotta talk about my favorite scene. Scott tries to buy a keg of beer, but he's underage. Listen, no ID, no goddamn beer. Can't you get that through your thick skull? Give me a keg of beer. And of course, he doesn't ask for any specific kind of beer. Just beer. During one of his basketball games, he gets the ball and they all huddle on top of him. His aggression takes over and he becomes a werewolf right in front of everyone's eyes. In real life, everyone would be freaking out, but here, they get excited about having a werewolf on the team, and he becomes a real big shot. It makes no sense, but it's a comedy, so you can go with it. Now the popular girl likes him, he's a star player, the team's winning, everything seems to be going good. But going around as a werewolf all the time starts to bring about problems. So, in order to win the final game and to get his life all back together and all that good shit, Scott just has to be himself. Not a bad moral, but come on, don't you want to see the werewolf again? The last act is just a long basketball game and becomes more like a sports movie. It's kind of like the tournament at the end of The Karate Kid, but at least there you get to see Daniel use some skills that he's learned to defeat his opponent. Here, nothing special happens. You keep thinking he's going to have to turn into the werewolf at the last minute, but it never happens. Overall, it's a fun movie, but too bad Scott's dad wasn't played by Christopher Lloyd. Right. So that's it. Do I really need to talk about Teen Wolf 2? Why not? No Michael J. Fox here. This time the star is Jason Bateman from the Hogan family. It's just a rip off of the first movie. Same plot, same gags, not a whole lot to say. Instead of high school, it's college. Instead of basketball, it's boxing. And instead of being a cool movie, it's just a bunch of horse shit. It's that certain kind of shit sequel that just tries to capitalize on the success of the first movie. It's almost like a musical because there's so many song and dance scenes. Oh, 
Oh my god, they even do the entire song. There was also the Teen Wolf cartoon, which I remember watching all the time when I was a kid. Nowadays, nobody seems to remember it anymore. It's faded into obscurity like other 80s cartoons, like Back to the Future, The Karate Kid, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Man, they must not hold up too well. Yeah, the Teen Wolf cartoon, it wasn't that great, but had some memorable voices. You know who that is? Well, that's it. Now let's tally the votes. Well, it's the same guy who did Ray Stans from the real Ghostbusters. Yep, Frank Welker, who was also Megatron and Soundwave. Best thing about the Teen Wolf cartoon? The intro. Is that 80s? Or is that 80s? Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> Spookies. With a title like that, you'd think this movie would be something like Ghoulies or Munchies. You know, one of those movies about little creatures running amok. But really, it's nothing like that. The basic premise is that a group of teenagers, played by actors who are probably around 30, go to a party but end up at a haunted mansion. The characters are all badly cliched. You even know where you're going? Yeah, I'm going nuts because I gotta stand here and listen to you. Yeah, 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 gag me with a spoon. Then there's this guy. Me too. <laughs> He's supposed to be comic relief. I do what he said. But really, it would be relief if he would just go away. Once inside the mansion, they all gather around an Ouija board, which brings out all the monsters. Now, I gotta stop and say, this is kind of like a hybrid of two movies. It was originally titled Twisted Souls, but it was never finished. The original director was fired and it got shelved. So Twisted Souls is all the teenagers in a haunted house footage. Then there's newly shot footage. Around 1985, they brought in a new director, who recut it and added an old wizard, a kid, a dead bride, and a werewolf in a vest. Actually, it's a werecat. Hmm, werecat. This new plot is mostly about the wizard who's trying to resurrect his bride. She hates him so much that she poisoned herself to stay away from him. Was this new director trying to turn it into a love drama? My power is nothing compared to the power your beauty has over me. You can tell it's two different movies cut together. One reason, because the teenagers never interact with the old wizard. And two, there's a big difference in quality of special effects. You have great effects in one scene and then crap effects in the next. Great? Crappy. Also, there's a kid that's being thrown a birthday party by the ghosts. Like, okay, if candles start lighting all by themselves, wouldn't you go running? Hey, that was really neat. Well, the kid ends up falling in a grave, and a werecat comes along and buries him alive. Why even have the kid in the movie at all? He's so irrelevant to the rest of the plot. Eh, even though the plot is so messed up with these two movies being cut together, it's still pretty fun to watch. And that's because of all the special effects. You get a lot of different creatures in this movie. And it's all practical with animatronics, puppets, and all-around 80s goodness. There's a lizard monster that looks kind of like the Gill Man, and an army of zombies. There's an electricity monster that shocks its victims. They even went to the extra effort of animating the skin melting away with stop motion. A statue in the house comes alive and it becomes the Grim Reaper. That's one of the more obscure monsters, kind of like the Cyclops. Don't you think there should be more Cyclops movies? Well, all right, there's the 2008 Cyclops that Roger Corman put together, but still, compare the amount of vampire movies to the amount of Cyclops movies. There's no comparison. Anyway, the point is the Grim Reaper is another character that falls into the category of underutilized monsters. Death needs some more exposure. And this is a pretty good example of a Grim Reaper on film. Did you know death is explosive? 
of the best effects is when a woman transforms into a giant spider. It's really disgusting and a great transformation scene. It even sucks the air out of the guy's head. I also like the muck men. The teens are in a wine cellar when the muck men arise from the ground and... Are they farting? There's no explanation. They're just farting. Well, I guess if you're a reanimated dead corpse, there's probably some gas buildup going on. Oh, and guess how they're killed? With wine. Okay, so wine kills them? Huh, maybe it was a bad year. With all these awesome creature effects, you'd think this film would be more widely known. It's not even available on DVD. Sure, it's virtually impossible to follow the plot, but the effects make it worth seeing. There's a lot of worse movies on DVD. It deserves an official release. It is on VHS, and that's probably the way it's going to stay for a while. What can you do? Just dust off the old VCR? Because some things will always be a relic of the past. <laughs>
currently under psychiatric care. No, really! There is a great twist where Medusa shows up to the house and kills an alien, not knowing that the alien was there to actually save them from the monster. And the ending has to be seen to be believed. I highly recommend this film, not because it's good, but because it's different. It has a magnetic quality that sucks you in. You can't help but finish watching it. The effects are great, the characters are cheesy and over the top, but it's self-aware and radical as hell. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. Something's coming. From Beyond is a 1986 sci fi horror flick from director Stuart Gordon. He also directed Reanimator, which stars many of the same cast members Barbara Crampton and Jeffrey Combs. It's based off a short story by H.P. Lovecraft, who also wrote Reanimator. Combs plays a scientist named Crawford, and as usual, his acting is over the top. Bit off his head like a gingerbread man. Early in the movie, he's in a mental hospital because he's been traumatized by his work. For some reason, the doors sound just like Star Trek. He's given a choice to recreate his experiment or stay in a straitjacket. You can either stay here for the rest of your life or you can come with me. That's not much of a choice, is it? Eventually, he's taken over by the experiment and becomes a monster with no control. There's another scientist named Dr. Pretorius. Pretorius! A tribute to the scientist in Bride of Frankenstein, <laughs> but in name only. Pretorius is the creator of a machine that heightens the senses of whoever uses it. It's addictive like a drug. The machine also kind of reminds you of the laboratory equipment in Frankenstein. In Frankenstein, the machine harnesses lightning to reanimate dead tissue. In From Beyond, it opens a universe of creatures. They look like flying eels. And for some reason, Pretorius is in this universe and he becomes a monster. You know what? I really can't explain it. All I can say is the special effects are amazing. The Pretorius creature goes through all these changes. They could have just had him transform once, but no, he morphs into several different forms. They really went the extra mile, and each form is more nasty than the last. It's a monster lover's delight. And the whole idea with these creatures flying around is that we can't see them until our senses are enhanced by this resonator. Ken Forey is here, probably best known from Dawn of the Dead, He's an assistant who's trying to see what's going on, but now he just wants to get the hell out. I got a better idea. How about if we disappear out the door? Don't you understand? This is the greatest discovery since Van Leeuwenhoek first looked through a microscope and saw an amoeba. Yeah, but he wasn't down there with the amoeba. So they keep turning the machine off and on, and then another side effect from this machine is that it makes them horny. Well, how about the hard on I got? Is there a statistical correlation for that too? Then the machine goes out of control. It's running itself! They try to stop it and eventually put a time bomb on it. It's one of those movies where every second on the clock is like 10 seconds. You think they only have a few seconds left to live, but then they cut back to the clock and barely any time has passed. Well, I timed it. I had to. From the 32 second mark to the 1 second mark takes the movie exactly 1 minute and 25 seconds. There are some flaws and the plot is bizarre, but the special effects steal the show. It's disgusting. If you like The Fly with Jeff Goldblum, this is probably up your alley because both are about scientists that go through transformations. And it's also some of the best effects from the 80s. From Beyond is a must see. <laughs> Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. 
so don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness, 80s-a-thon. The gate refers to a hole in the ground that is literally a gate to hell. Demons come out to terrorize children who are home alone. They buried the dog in the backyard and that acted as a sacrifice allowing the demons to come forth. And that's not all. If there's two more sacrifices, a giant beast will emerge and take over the world. How do we know all this? Because this kid Glenn's nerdy pal, Terry. We accidentally summoned demons who used to rule the universe to come and take over the world. Who looks like Paul Pfeiffer from The Wonder Years, except Terry is the metal version. While listening to some records, he finds a backwards message. It's the album. Backwards. It tells you how to close the gate. Well, I guess it's a damn good thing he had those records or else they would have been totally fucked. What makes this film so creepy is that the main characters are all children. It preys on their innocence. There's a scene where Glenn hugs his dead mother, who turns into his dead dog. But the dog is dead dead, not living dead like the mother. It doesn't make any sense, but the point is, this film doesn't care about killing children and animals. Come on, you don't kill a dog. People get upset. I imagine the dog sitting around their TV saying, don't kill the humans. There's no relief to the hell these kids go through. They can't even trust the parents. You've been back. What the fuck? <laughs> anyway, the real highlight is the stop motion special effects. These little guys running around are awesome. Was that cool or what? Ooh, I wouldn't want to see that thing in the middle of the night. There's also a really disturbing moment where Terry has to stomp on one of them. Ugh, oh, just put it out of its misery. Probably the funniest moment is when Terry becomes possessed and gets stabbed in the eye with a Barbie doll. I've never seen that one before. In the end, Glenn faces the lead demon that somehow makes an eyeball appear in his hand. Bizarre. The only way to talk about this movie is to describe each individual moment. To sum things up, The Gate is worth watching for the last half hour. That's when all the great effects happen. I say check it out. to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s-a-thon. <laughs> Pumpkinhead is about a man seeking revenge for the death of his son. He goes to a witch hoping she'll bring the kid back to life. She can't help him. All she can do is take you straight to hell. So, okay, she summons a monster instead to act out his revenge. With a title like Pumpkinhead, you'd think the monster's head would be a pumpkin, but no, it just comes from a pumpkin patch. Yeah, it's a stupid, irrelevant title. Kind of looks like the Xenomorph from Aliens. Well, there's a connection. It's directed by Stan Winston, a special effects legend who worked on Aliens, Terminator, Edward Scissorhands, Jurassic Park, Monster Squad, Austin Powers, Predator, and many more. Interesting to see him in the director's chair. He also directed a gnome named Norm. Giant popos. <gasps> the main character, Harley, is played by Lance Hendrickson, who played Bishop in Aliens. So if you like Aliens, you might like Pumpkinhead. The monster feels whatever Harley feels, and the other way around. It has E.T. syndrome. What can I say about this film? It's no masterpiece, but it's above average. The look of the film is its strongest asset. The production quality is top-notch, and the monster looks incredible. 
proving that a combination of suit and animatronics is the most authentic way to go. Too bad nobody does this shit anymore. The witch makeup, on the other hand, is that typical old person makeup. It's what you wanted. Sort of like in a 60s Star Trek episode. The movie feels like a classic monster movie, like Creature from the Black Lagoon, and The Wolfman, perhaps, because it's set in the woods with fog everywhere. It's loaded with horror cliches, like false scares. So what's not to love? It's not a major classic or anything, but it deserves to come out of the shadows of obscurity, and Pumpkinhead should be in more movies. Like how about Rambo vs. Pumpkinhead? Fuck em. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> Puppet Master was a direct to video movie released in 1989. It's about a group of psychics who are murdered by puppets. So if you like puppet movies, this is for you. Charles Band was a script writer. He's basically a schlockmeister like Roger Corman who makes movies faster than Grease Lightning. He established a whole brand of B-movies. As the film starts, we see this guy Andre Toulon crafting his puppets. He's the puppet maker and the keeper of the eternal secret of life. He's played by William Hickey, same guy from the Tales from the Crypt episode, The Switch. Here he's being pursued by spies, so he shoots himself in the head in order to keep his secret safe. It's disturbing, and isn't it interesting how this kind of thing can be really grim, like in Full Metal Jacket, yet can also be kind of funny, like in Maniac. The rest of the plot revolves around a guy named Neil, who's discovered Toulon's secrets to bring inanimate objects to life. In addition to being able to control the puppets, he's also an undead zombie. You're dead. Yes, I am. He tricks a bunch of psychics to stay in a hotel and one by one kills them off with his puppets. Imagine staying in a hotel and seeing these little things running around. They each have their own method of killing. This one uses a drill on its head. And this one spits out leeches. It's disgusting. Imagine if you got attacked by puppets in real life. Would you be that scared? I think I'd be pissed off. I'd say, get the fuck off me, you little shit. I'd throw those fuckers against the wall. You brainless little pinhead, get out of my way. But he shouldn't abuse his own puppets, because they get really mad. Open that door, you fucking little cretin. Reminds me of Shredder. You cretin. These puppets turn against their master and really punish this guy. He bleeds green, I guess because he's undead, but these puppets are going to make him dead dead. Puppet Master has a cult fan base and launched a whole series. For a movie that has so many sequels, I don't think it's really that good. The first 40 minutes drag. Once the puppets start coming out, it's entertaining enough. It helps if you're really into killer puppet movies. So if you are, check it out. Word to your mummy. You know what time it is. So don't go anywhere. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. 80s a thon. <laughs> Ever since the first Monster Madness, I've gotten an overwhelming amount of requests for killer clowns from outer space. Alright, so let's get to it. Time to stop clowning around. <laughs> On the box art of the DVD, it says, In space, no one can eat ice cream. That's a parody of the tagline to Alien, which was, In space, no one can hear you scream. This movie is full of little tributes like that. One example is when a clown gets hit by a car, the camera does a rack focus, and he sits up the same way Michael Myers did in the original Halloween. 
Another example is the beginning, which is kind of like a tribute to the blob and all those classic sci-fi films, with some teenagers who spot a meteor. But this time it's not just a chunk of rock, but a spaceship in the shape of a giant big circus tent. And this big top circus tent turns out to be a big top. A farmer comes along thinking the circus arrived in town, but soon finds that this isn't the Ringling Brothers experience that he had hoped for. Next, the teenagers enter the space tent to find the core, which is designed as a tribute to the underground compound in Forbidden Planet. They find the local townsfolk hanging like flies caught in a spider's web, but instead cotton candy. <coughs> the clowns chase them out of the tent with their popcorn guns. They barely manage to escape the ship with their lives, and now the clowns are out on the loose creating havoc and destruction wherever they go. Before Captain Spaulding and Pennywise, there were the blood-drinking killer clowns from outer space. Actually, they're not even clowns at all. They're aliens who just happen to resemble clowns. They have an arsenal of weapons to make them even more threatening. Acid-filled pies, already mentioned the popcorn guns, and killer balloon animals. The kids try to warn the police of the intergalactic clown menace, but like so many other movies of the genre, the police don't believe them until it's too late. Killer clowns from outer space. Holy shit! While the kids are busy trying to convince them, the clowns are busy pillaging the town. There's not much to it. It's all just an excuse to see some killer clowns run loose, and it's really a delight. I won't summarize every scene, and besides, most people have seen the movie. If you haven't seen it by any chance, it's worth a watch. But I will describe some of my favorite moments. There's of course the part with the clown doing the shadow puppets. That seems to be most people's favorite. Holy shit! The part where the clown preys on a little girl is kind of disturbing, but darkly comedic. I almost forgot to mention, I heard that some of the clown heads used during filming ended up being used in Ernest Scared Stupid. The finale is a real doozy. The teens encounter Clownzilla, which is the leader of the intergalactic candy corn threat. They wanted this to be stop motion, but for money and time reasons, they used the guy in a rubber suit, hence the Godzilla name. I also like when they see all the cotton candy bodies hanging as food to be later consumed. That's a pretty big body count. Even though you don't see most of the killings, they probably killed more people than Jason, Freddy, and Michael Myers combined. The Chiodo brothers wrote, directed, and did the effects for the film. They did the effects for Large Marge in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It looked like this! <laughs> Their style makes the whole film look like some kind of twisted cartoon world. Most everything in the foreground is bright colors and the backgrounds are always black. There's also these footprints on the ground which remind me of Daffy Duck and the Great Piggy Bank robbery. That's the best way to describe it. This film is very much like a cartoon. It combines horror with slapstick comedy and wacky art design to boot. It's gotten a huge cult fan base. Whenever it plays in a theater, people throw popcorn and cotton candy, they shout out lines of dialogue, almost like Rocky Horror Picture Show. That's why I've always felt, you know, this movie is so well known, what's the point of talking about it? That's the reason I've never reviewed it before. I think one of the main reasons it has such an appeal is because lots of people find clowns frightening. I've never been into the whole clown thing. I don't find them scary at all especially if we're talking about ordinary clowns. It's not a phobia I've ever experienced myself. To me, this film is just another product of the 80s. A great one, but one of many. Since this was 80s-a-thon, I had to do it. Of course, there's still many 80s movies I didn't get time to do. There's The Lost Boys, of course. That's another really famous one. They Live is also pretty well known. I had to leave enough room for the more obscure films. Night of the Creeps, that's another one I wanted to do, so I'm never going to feel complete. There's always next year. I hope to do it again. So for now, hope you enjoyed the 80s-a-thon, and happy Halloween.